camera. That's what I'm called. There you go. Yeah. That's how you shoot. Well done. <laughs> Right out of the gate, we got a lion kill. This was when I first realized that there might be a problem with my scope. This is, a, this is an outstanding trophy. This is it's your first animal in Africa? <laughs> it is my first animal in Africa. So I finally made it over to Africa after a few years delay. COVID shut everything down and that delayed my trip. At SHOT Show this year, I met Romano from RDB Safaris and instantly I knew this is the guy that I want to hunt with. So we had a few quick conversations at SHOT Show and then followed up right after that and boom, here we are in April, just a few months after the SHOT Show and I'm in Africa. You're going to get to see what makes Romano unique, what makes his hunting area unique, why you want to hunt with him and why you can trust him. We're also gonna go on a few day trips. We're going to check out golf course. We go and visit a taxidermist in South Africa to learn exactly what happens to your trophies and how you get them back in the United States. And we're gonna go on a big five uh, safari, photo safari. You're gonna see me hunt six different animals and you're going to see some great shots and some not so great shots. But through it all, what you'll see is these guys don't stop. They make sure that you get the experience and you get your animals. And at the end of the day, you're happy and you go back to your room with a smile on your face. I'm Ramona De Beer. I'm the outfitter of RDB Safaris and I've been in the professional hunting industry for nine years. So first day on Jeremy and Brian Safari, we woke, we, we woke up early. We had a booking at Ntombeni for a big five game drive at 6.30 the, the morning. Right out of the gate, we got a lion kill. Went off to the lion kill and saw the lions lying around and then uh, the big man, yeah. like he got himself a big portion of meat. Uh, the others are just uh, scraping off whatever that's remaining. And uh, because of the fact that there's a little bit of uh, cups, four cups, uh, the, the females are the ones that will actually not eat much. Uh, they will be considerate, thinking about the cups, uh -huh. so allowing them to eat. You can see how the structure works. Obviously, the the male will eat first, because that's the way it works in a lion structure. With that, the female will feed the cubs first before they try to get any meat. And so it goes on as we are viewing at this um, feeding with the lions, the male stood up, went like 20 yards and lay down. He stood up afterwards that, and he was calling his tribe and, like saying, let's go. And as we drove with them, he gave a warning to say, listen, you viewed enough. So I want to go into where, wherever space I can get to go and lay down, like his home, and gave us a warning, like a small growl and said, yeah, you need to go. Then we spotted some, some rhino. Saw a big male um, white rhino, really good. He was grazing around, really short grasses, what they love to do. 
the guide will also explain why, what, what, what he's doing, why does he graze on short grasses, and what is, it, why does he keep the, the grasses like that and the area like that and stuff, or why does he eat in that certain types of um, spaces, if I can say it like that. We drove along a few minutes and came down to um, a big dam where we spotted hippo. We're quite under the water, so there was not really much to see, but you could have seen there was about three or four hippos in the water. And then we just drove along and spotted the elephant. Also very cool to see in Africa when you're on a big five game drive, one of the best sightings I'll, I'll say because this is such a majestic animal. We, we actually spotted it really far and couldn't really see what's going on and we couldn't see how much there was, but then the guy took us on another road, came closer and wow, just one popped up in the middle of the road. And for us, what a privilege, because it's a, it's a bull and that was cool to see. Seeing all the animals on a game drive was a very unique experience to see rhinos and elephants and all these different species in their natural habitat. I would highly recommend this for anyone that visits. After the game drive, we need to head back to sight in the rifle and get ready to go hunting. Back at the range, we zeroed in my rifle. I'm shooting a Blazer R8 in 300 Win Mag using 180 grain Barnes TTSX. On top, I've got a Swarovski Z8i. The silencer I'm using is the Bowers Group Verse 375, rated for 375 H and H all the way down. Sounds great on my 300 Win Mag, and it's a perfect silencer for Africa. For a full breakdown of all the gear that I used on this trip, make sure and view our accompanying video that shows all of the gear as well as recommendations. With a few adjustments, we are ready to go. What would well, you recommend? I would, I would say, I would, I would feel good with a, a wildebeest or golden wildebeest. Doesn't mind me. We can do both also. It's fine. But. I would actually, I don't know how you feel about zebra. Oh, I feel fine about zebra. Because zebra <laughs> is, is, it's, I don't know, it's a, it's a really That's authentic funny. and yeah, it's iconic to South Africa and it's something, right. some people as, as, as a thing about zebra and, and giraffe, not shooting them, it's, it's still the same <laughs> thing, it's, it's nature conservation, we, yeah, need, to, we need to hunt them and they're getting, like most farms are overpopulated with exactly those animals, so why not hunt them? Because it's exactly nature conservation. So. I don't have I don't have a problem with with either one of them. Actually, I mean, yeah. actually, something that's on my list at some point is a giraffe. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so, you know, yeah. um, really cool. The rifle is in, and we are all fine with that. So heading out, driving around, see what we see, and yeah, if we spot something that's on the list, we just stalk it from there. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy for now. Yeah. It's easy, <laughs> it's easy when we say, say it. it. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Looking for zebra, um, we spotted a, a herd with very good golden wildebeest trophies in them. Wind was in our favor, and we just walked along the road, got to the end of, of the, the stand of trees, and the golden wildebeest was standing in the open area again. We just waited for a shot, and as he turned broadside, Jeremy took the shot, and perfectly placed shot. There you go, open shot. Yeah. Shot at him. Where is he? It's the one in the middle now. Going down? He's hurting. Give him another shot if you can. Got 
come here on this side. No, he's standing there. There he's, there he's, he's going down. I see him. Jim again? Yeah. Wait, wait. Yeah, try. <laughs> okay, give him time. Give him time. Completely down. You just keep your eye on him. I shot it and then it started running. Romano says, shoot again. Boom, I shoot it again. It ran back the other direction. He goes, shoot again. Boom, I shoot it again. And then down it goes. I didn't expect it to take that many hits and just soak up the bullets like it did. I'm shooting a 300 Win Mag and all the shots were, were like this close to each other, um, right where they need to be. But they don't call it the poor man's Cape Buffalo for, for any reason. I mean, they're very, very tough animals. Well, well done. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, well man. Well done. It's your first animal in Africa. It is my first animal in Africa. And that's a golden old beast. <laughs> that's, that's very cool. That's awesome, yeah. Jason isn't going to be like in soft, right. just in meat. So, yeah. But it's still a great shot. Still a good shot, yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, so two of them, I mean, this is when he was running and I was obviously aiming a little far forward. Forward, yeah. In because you wanted, you wanted to, him to run into the bullet. Right. Yeah. All the markings, this, this is what you want on a proper wildebeest trophy. It's all the secondary growth coming out from the horn and then also the markings just makes the bull what it is and he's been around. So, so the lungs are running, the lungs are running down here. Your heart, the heart is sitting down here in the bottom of the chest. Okay. Yeah. Right here, right here. The heart is sitting here. So that there, going forward, is a textbook shot. It's double lung, maybe the top of the heart as well. Walking up to it, it was much bigger than I than I thought. You know, that's that's one thing about Africa is that we don't have anything to really compare because we haven't. If, you, if it's your first trip, you haven't seen these animals before. Until you get up on them and put hands on them, you don't realize how massive some of these animals can be. So whenever I mentioned to people about what I was going to hunt in Africa, and I talked about the color variants of the golden wildebeest and the impala and the blessed buck, several people hadn't heard of these variations. And this is one of the things that's unique about what they offer here at RDB Safaris. That was one thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to shoot some color variants, some things that were unique and that just weren't on every game farm across South Africa. On every hunt I've ever done, shot wildebeest. So I'm proud of breeding golden wildebeest and having them on my farm. It's a love and a passion of me to breed color variants itself, not just golden wildebeest, but it was always been a passion of mine and still are. Um, so that's why I do it for hunting purposes, is breeding um, color variants. So yeah, they, they are pretty unique. If you took a few years back, I've been breeding quite a long time with golden wildebeest, because it was one of my first, them in black impala was one of my first color variants I started with. They are still very unique. I would say there is a lot of guys that has it, but it's all about the color of the gold and the genetic spread to get that certain gold color in them. If it's not that light color on the, on the hair at the back or on, on the full hide, it's not the best genetics. Um, I feel to have the light gold color in it and even if it's got a gold patch on the side, like a king wildebeest, and I mean, that's, that's when it's the most beautiful. Yeah, I feel the genetics at RDB Safaris are some of the best, most probably in South Africa. After a great first day, I was excited to hunt more and see some of the area that we hadn't explored yet. <laughs>
going back to color variants, one of the color variants that they have here is white blessed buck. This stalk was, was pretty interesting. So we, when we stalked up on the zebra, yeah. we went around and we literally had like half a second shot maybe. Yeah. But we almost did. Yeah, yeah. But they just moved out of the way. Moved out. Yeah. And then we've been driving around for an hour and a half. Yeah. We tracked some. Yeah. We couldn't get on them. Yeah. But now we're what an hour left. Yeah, there's an hour left maybe of sunlight. So the change of plan now is to go after the the blaze buck. So okay. when we were there um, seeing the zebra, there was an open land. We're going back for the blaze buck because they were also roaming around there. So yeah. Um, we'll be stalking down here, okay. like I said, no wind, nothing, so it's not going to be effective to whatever we're doing from here, um, however, there's buffalo, so I'm going to grab the backup rifle. Okay. Give him a minute. I 
they're looking at you. They're looking up. Oh, they stood up. They stood up. There we go. Just wait, wait to turn. Yeah. Miss? Yeah. Clean miss, right? Yeah. It's the one in the back, yeah. Back, yeah. Okay, yep. He's facing dead on me. You can do a frontal on the same. Okay, wait. If he stands. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit. Let's give him a chance. <laughs> okay, do you have open shot? Okay, just leave him for 40 seconds. Okay, the there he is. And the buffalo left also now. I was scared of the, the shot. Yeah. Because those are the two bulls. Yeah, there was two, two <laughs> buffalo bulls, so... Yeah. Yeah, I just don't want to mess up something we don't need to mess up. So. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Well done. Well done. Man. Well done. That's yeah, uh, we took our time and it paid off. Yeah. Well, at the end. I um, I just feel like I was a little forward on that first shot. Yeah, it's, but it's because it, it jumped. He, well, not jumped, it started moving. It was so, moving, yeah. And it was like literally on the split second. I, like, like I you, didn't have a shot. He was fixing it. Going, yeah. yeah, I was fixing to lose it because there was this brush in the way. Exactly. Yeah. But he didn't go far. He was clearly hurt. Yeah. I mean, I think he, if we had just waited even more, he would have fell over. Fell over. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, it's done and then, and that's all that counts. So. Patience. Yeah, patience. It pays off. I didn't hear the first shot because it was like the leg, so yeah. I didn't have that thump into the skin. I think it was either low yeah. or real far forward. Yeah, it looked it looked like the front leg. Front leg just yeah. broke the front leg. Yeah, because the way it was run, it was running, he couldn't step on the front leg. Right. Yeah. A little far back. Yeah. Look, I should, that was where the first hit was. Way low. Yeah. Way low. Yeah. This was when I first realized that there might be a problem with my scope. Wow. That's that is wide, cool looking. Wide ones, yeah. That is cool. Yeah. That is very, very cool. No, it's great, man. I'm super, I'm super excited. I'm just disappointed with my first shot. <laughs> that thing is so freaking cool. The fur on it is completely different than a regular blessed buck. But what's even cooler is the horns. And the horns are white, but they look almost chalky. Um, they're just they're just really unique. This is this is like a this is a decent representative of the species. I won't say this is the biggest trophy I've ever shot on a blessed buck, but also with that a white blessed buck is a color variant of uh, of the normal blessed buck and for white this is a good representative um, even for a normal blessed buck but yeah i feel that the white blessed buck white blessed buck horns genetic wise doesn't grow as big as the normal ones
After hunting, we took a little break, and I wanted to ask Romano exactly how RDB Safaris got started and what his background was as a PH. So where it all started was, um, let's go back to the beginning. Um, it was from actually my father, um, where he did hunting as a hobby, gone through na nature conservation and hunting, he feel doing hunting is nature conservation. I grew up with that and we used to go on hunts with my dad, take us with his friends. And so it started all maybe since I was 12 years old. We bought a farm as a family. Weekend, I would ask my father, well, let's go to the farm. So he would ask me to take some of his friends out so I can, because I, I always told him I, I want to be like a guide. So after school, I went to a place called Impala. Um, it's like a game ranger training. And we did some guiding, game ranger training, um, field guiding, then the love for literally everything in nature conservation just it exploded for me and i was like okay i'm going to study a diploma in nature conservation so i studied nature conservation from 2011 up until 2014 while i was doing my practicals in 2014 on the farm we owned in mark and limpopo um, i decided to do a professional hunting course at David Sutherland. Now I'm a nature conservationist and I'm a PH. So this is literally doing nature conservation throughout hunting. And what better way of doing conservation? With hunting, it's just, it just opened everything in my mind why I do what I do. So we had a lot of poaching in at the farm we used to own in Marken, Limpopo. It started getting too heavy to manage everything on the farm because of all this poaching. I mean, there was some, some nights or literally over, let's say a long weekend that some of them didn't work and all of them were in the community that would have came in with dogs, like 20 to 30 dogs, five of them, and literally poached 30 animals a night. I mean, you can't keep up with that. We decided, you know what? We need to get rid of this and go look for another, another farm and do nature conservation. And we ended up buying a farm in uh, the Waterberg, uh, in Mok just past Mokhopong, between Mokhopong and Mokopane, in the Limpopo area. And it's called Sikopo Private Game Reserve.
So if you look at our logo, it's, it's got the lion in the Africa. So you think it's, well, obvious that someone, a South African outfitter or any African outfitter would have, or the king of Africa on his logo. I mean, it's actually not that because there's very few outfitters that has the lion. It all started when studying for nature conservation. So my friends with whom I studied with started calling me Leo and the scientific name for what it means is is a lion it's so the, the full scientific name is Pantero Leo everyone kept on calling me till today my friends called me Leo I always wanted a Doberman dog and with the sharpie pointy ears and everything and I, I bought one from a breeder and I just fell in love with him. I didn't want to cut his ears, this little puppy, and I called him Pantera. Why I called him Pantera is because he completes me as the lion. Then he's Pantera and I'm Leo, and that makes a full genus and species name scientifically as a lion. Um, sorry, I get goosebumps because of that actually makes me feel wow and um, so I decided this means something to me to be the lion with my dog and that's why RDB Safaris as a lion and well I'm an African South African outfitter we also do Botswana hunts so why not have the Africa logo not just South Africa so I just I just I just got a bit of emotion or emotional it, because I haven't told, told that story and when I say this puppy and called him lion and we connected like a lion it's just one of the most iconic animals of Africa is a zebra and it was the bane of my existence. <laughs> you know, really, you think of a zebra and you think, you just walk up and shoot it. You know, not even remotely close. As soon as we got within eyesight of these guys, they took off and they're staying way away from us. Yeah, so zebra is most probably, it could be an easy hunt one day. The other day it's one of your most terrible hunts you've ever seen because they can be skittish and they are alert um, there's i mean in open fields in brushed areas dense areas i mean they go anywhere they they pop up wherever you drive on if it's in a condensed area like dense limpopo area or it's in the free state where it's open plains, I mean, they're still not, it's still not an easy hunt every time, and it's still not the, the most worst hunt, but it's, it's all depending on that day. The zebra is alert, and he won't give you the opportunity just by walking up to it and killing it. It's just not how it's gonna happen. It's just as, tough as hunting any other animal in Africa. Almost every day that we went hunting, we started out looking for zebra and had no luck. But Romano, being the guy that he is, he knew where to go around the bush and come up and get us close to the zebra. So he got us about, you know, 250-ish yards away. The zebras were constantly moving and we made a shot on the zebra and what I didn't know at the time was that my scope was actually loose on my gun. He's, if that one wasn't in the way. Three hundred. 
Huh? How far is that? I can't do that. But they're all bundled up now. Yeah, I know they're all grouped. So he's, he's still the closest one. Yep. Add to us. Yep. It's about a 370. Jeez. Okay. I think your 300 was low. Really? Okay. Yeah, it hit in front of them. Okay. I shot low on the zebra, and it made for a very long day of tracking. At one point we thought we had found the wounded zebra and it was a very tense moment as we lined up and waited for this herd to cross the road. Just wait, just wait. Rolling. It was an experience that I'll never forget because we tracked this zebra for five miles, maybe even more, through thick brush, finding the blood track, finding its trails as it crossed over the roads, and it didn't really present us with uh, very many shots afterwards, but it was just tracking and tracking and tracking and tracking, and I thought the day would never end. But Adrenaline kept me going the entire time. Finally, I got a shot on it, but unfortunately not on camera. Done because we yeah, found yeah. it. Well done. Oh, no. Yeah. Great shot. It was, yeah. He well, gave us a run for our money. <laughs> yeah. At the end of it, great shot, putting it down, and that's hunting. And, you know, to recover the animal at the end of the day, that's all you need and that's what you want. It's real Africa, it's tracking, it's tracking through the, through the bush. I mean, <laughs> if you didn't do that, you didn't have a, a real African experience. Yeah, and the celebration afterwards, after a hard day, was again, it, it can't be described, the feeling and the weight lifted off of you once you have this animal on the ground. It's. It's incredible. So it is quite common to track an animal after the first shot. I mean, it's not daily you'll go out and shoot any South African animal on a 200, 300, 400 yard shot. So it's not actually as how good of a shot you are. Even if you have good shot placement, so African anim animals are tough. There's, there's most probably going to be to have a follow-up shot. Uh, between the 65 and 70 percent of animals requires tracking because of the toughness of the animal, firstly, bad shot placements, obviously. And obviously with that the adrenaline rush, coming to Africa, shooting your first animals, um, even though it's not even your first animal. Like I said, it's the toughness of the animal also. So. When tracking animals, uh, clients most probably are surprised by how far we need to track sometimes. So it's, it's, it's common that you need to track. Um, so people don't need to be surprised um, if there's any tracking involved by shooting an animal. But at the end of it, hopefully you can retrieve the animal. <laughs> African hunt is based on literally walking, stalking, tracking, finding, 
retrieving animals, all of those. It's obviously nice to complete everything and have all the animals shot and at, with one shot and they're all dead and all of that. But I would feel if you don't do tracking, you didn't hunt in Africa. That night I checked my scope and it was off. I tightened it up with the toolkit I brought and re-zeroed it the next morning. Now I was ready to go after a blue wildebeest. Right beside it. <laughs> Me and Jamie decided, well, why not do have the slam by adding blue wildebeest? And that was an option. So we agreed up on that and we went off the blue wildebeest. A decent group of uh, blue wildebeest. We stood in the far, so we, we glanced at them and saw that there's two proper bulls in this herd of, of wildebeest. Our plan was to let the vehicle drive along without us and we will stay there and we will stalk from there. So the wind was in our favor and the only thing that was a bit difficult to do was the sun was shining on us and that creates a long shade. So the wind blowing from this direction? Yeah, it's, it's not towards them, it's not towards us, but it's in our favor still. Kind of a little quartering. Yeah, quartering. And, um, so we're gonna use this brush, moving along this side, trying to not show our shade too much because that's extra movement on the floor. Right. So we're we'll moving on this side and trying to get to the other brush in front and that will give us a closer shot. Okay. There he goes, he's collapsing. I heard the head. How far is that? 300, here we go. Yeah, we're staying on just to get a bit closer. So far, that frontal shot was good. I think maybe he, he took a bit of his, maybe a bit to the one side more. Right. But it's mostly because he wasn't standing straight to you. He was standing more with his right side open. Right. Like literally caught him. Let's just wait right here for a second, huh? Better to wait. Yeah. Close and wait on the spot. Yeah. This is good. Oop. One. There you go. I don't even know if it's a neck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well done. <laughs> That was great. 
That was really good. That was the, the, the best way of, that's, that's what you need to do after a shot is go for a lot. Yeah. As quick as possible. Um, the thing is, that might, if it might not be placed the correct, on the correct um, <coughs> spot. Right. You never know. So always try to get up as close as possible. Get ready again. Get ready again and give him another shot. That was great. All right. Well done. That was good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I told you I can shoot, man. <laughs> yeah, look at that thick horns. So that was the that was the three hundred yard hit. Wow. <laughs> Like literally exactly where you need to play. Yeah, I yeah. Well done. <laughs> yeah, that, that is. Uh, so that's, uh, that's why I just, I just aimed right here to drop it right in. That is, that is excellent. Look at that. Yeah. It's, it's a very good trophy. Secondary grab started. And if you don't see any light on the face, you'll see every, every um, young male yeah. has a gold front. And it starts getting smaller and smaller as he's as he ages yeah that's on the normal wildebeest so you want it super dark dark and this is completely dark yeah it's solid actually, black yeah there's no white there this is a a decent <laughs> cool good spread it's got markings on he's got a secondary growth yeah that is what you want the secondary growth right here yeah the second layer coming in and you can tell he's really beat up and, and like I said, fighting a lot. This, this spot, when they're born, this whole spot right here, this whole spot, like from there up to here, is it, it looks golden. Right. Like, like this, like this color back here. Yeah, huh? yeah like that inside. It, yes. So if that is all gone. That means he's a he's an old bull. Also, that's also how you can spot an older bull. Man, this. Look at this, though. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, he's he's really he's done a lot, man. I like I like the character that this has. This is I can see though why they call it the poor man's Cape Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> Not only are they tough, but they look they look a lot like Cape Buffalo. Come to this side. We'll move to this other side. That's yeah. <laughs> Literally a 300 flat out, maybe 300.1 yard shot. Yeah, 300 yard shot. Right there. That's solid. Look at this. Oh, this. It's beautiful. Yeah, no, it's great. It's fantastic. I can't tell you how happy I am now after. Yeah. After being on the struggle bus. Yeah, yeah, man. That is, <laughs> the blue wildebeest was in an open area, and being able to to take that shot and stay on it and shoot it at distance was just was a really good feeling. My name is Robert Acosta. I'm the general manager here at RDB Safaris. I've been a PH for the last four years. What makes RDB Safaris so different is the integrity that we have. We and our ethics are so much more stricter than other outfitters. And you know, we, we really we really practice ethical hunting, ethical conservation through hunting. Why hunt with RDB Safaris? is mostly honesty. So when, when you come to any trade show or come up to me or email me or whatever, I'm gonna tell you what 
what, what we do, where we're from, how big the area is where you'll be hunting, what animals you'll, you can hunt. We do ethical hunting and any of our peers knows what I stand for and I won't jeopardize any of my, my integrity of being an ethical hunter. Romano has done improvements to the land such as water wells and uh, small ponds to give the animals the ability to get to water easily. He ensures that the diversity of the environment from the grasses to the trees is where it needs to be so that no matter what species is on the property, it has what it needs to be healthy and sustainable for the future. Hunting is the best way through conservation because if that doesn't happen, the population can't be controlled. It's, and everything that goes apart with it. I mean, if there's no population of animals, the ecosystem will just collapse. After shooting the wildebeest, so we saw an impala across the field on the other direction. And we came back up and made a very long stalk out in the open. The only thing I can do is walk straight toward it, right? Spontaneously just, we're gonna walk actually straight into like the mountain. Okay. But like just step for step, we're gonna get closer, closer, closer. Okay. And then hopefully come up to 200 yards. Okay, sounds good. And take a shot. Perfect. We had this little bitty small bush that we were using as kind of a point to keep between us and the Impala. And so we were crouched really low because the sun's going down to minimize our shadows. And we, we had to go about 200 yards in this, this position. And we get up to the Impala and the Impala is a little over 200 yards. My breathing, my heart rate is up from crouching and going that far and I really can't get it under control. But at any point, the other Impala that were in the wood line can just run off. They can see us and bolt. They were already kind of looking at us and so we were in a time crunch here. Huh? He's right there. He's right in the wood. Line. And I could tell I'm going up and down, up and down, trying to control my, my breathing and get my heart rate under control. And I shoot, and it's in line, it's just low. And so what wound up happening is it hit like the liver area. And we didn't know it at the time because I shot, I knew I hit, we heard the impact, it ran toward the tree line and the other Impala didn't run. Just left. Right. The, other one just... the one that was at the back was close to where he was. That's why I thought it was him, but only thing to do is go up there and check, right? Yeah. Go check the tree line. Yeah. Started following the blood trail. The blood trail went up the mountain, but we've only got about an hour and a half of daylight left. So we start up the mountain. Robert comes up to help us look and Romano and I get ahead of the camera guy and get ahead of Robert up this tall mountain and we're just trying to move as fast as we can because we know that we're running out of light. It went to an area where we thought, okay, we've maybe got two minutes of daylight left and we'll come back in the morning. So we come back in the morning um, and that night I'm like, please, 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 no jackals get this Impala. 
and let us find it quick. We bring the trackers out. We bring out three trackers, plus my camera guy, plus Robert, Romano, me. So there's a lot of people in the field looking for this thing. And we were out there maybe 15, 20 minutes, and I was the one to find it. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. That's a good looking Impala. That's great. Yeah. That's a good, good Impala. That's a really good Impala. That's a good Impala. This is, a, this is an outstanding trophy. This is. So how old do you think this guy is? I would, I would say around about five, six years old. And how long do they normally live? About 10 years. Okay. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> that was a really, really good feeling. So finding my own Impala after I shot it was freaking awesome. That was just the icing on the cake to finding it quick. And hey, the meat was still good and nothing had eaten it. So double plus. So we get the Impala loaded and we go back around the mountain, kind of to where the area was where we saw the blessed buck the previous day, and there they are in the field. And I looked at Romano and I said, blessed buck. So he goes, okay, here's what we're going to do. Hop off the vehicle here. I'm going to send the vehicle out. The blessed buck are going to watch the vehicle go out. And then we're going to stalk through this wood line over here and then go straight out into this field, kind of behind some trees and cover and stalk up to them. So that's exactly what we did. We made our way. We saw one that had an injured leg. That was the one we we're going to go after. And we got up to it. It was a little over 200 yards. I got down on it and I was feeling really good from finding the Impala and super, super steady. He's the one on the right by the tree, not the one in the back. So yeah. if, you, if you see him in the scope, you know he's got big horns. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, left the tree, sorry. He's walking now. He's, he's turning. So, uh, are you ready? He's going down. He's going down. Yeah. Oh, good hit. Yep. That's that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Yeah, buddy. That's a kill shot. Hoorah! That's on target. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> that's how you shoot. Well done. That well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's well done. Fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about a shot. I was like, please, please, please. <laughs> yeah. Please, no more Just, tracking. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's keep it clean now. <laughs> <laughs> but you've done it. That was that was awesome. That that's the type of shot exactly on the, the blue of these. That's yeah, exactly. That's 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 what you want. That's exactly what you want. That's... <laughs> yeah, he, he he ran literally maybe 15 yards and just... Piled up, yeah. yeah. He was like, there's there's no way I'm going further. Yeah. I'm just gonna put my legs to the to the sky and <laughs> I'm, I'm out. See you later. Yeah, that's, that's 
that's plain if you if you hunt in the plains um couldn't could get closer to it you yeah. know they alerted so where we got to and have a 215 220 yard shot um shot placement textbook couldn't do it any better that's great that is that I'm is happy. that is what you want things are going right <laughs> yeah that's solid yeah well two, done two animals in uh how uh literally how May, an yeah. hour <laughs> well i would say half an hour half an hour <laughs> yeah. we recovered the impala and we got a blessed buck in yeah so all the darkness in here you see it's a fully grown um blessed buck and yeah <sighs> good shot you can see a bit of second you can see the secondary growth from the horn and then yeah this is a proper blessed buck you can tell how beat up it is yeah he's been fighting a lot yeah yeah and yeah so was this his this was his sore foot sore foot yeah yeah so this was he was already so get this he was already limping he was limping from a sore sore foot so it was good to good to take him out too yeah it was really really good and that was just another really really great i mean you found the impala we had blessed buck on the ground within an hour so what a freaking morning that was that was just great again celebrations all around and we just kept talking about it because you know it was a great shot and it went down just like that since we recovered the impala so quickly and got a blessed buck right after it we still had time for a day trip on friday so we went into town to Nelstrom Taxidermy to see Paul, and that place is phenomenal. Hi, welcome to South Africa and Nelstrom Taxidermy here in Little Limpopo. Um, pleased to meet you all, and I want to show you a bit more of the taxidermy. Um, we are looking forward to meet you all on your next trip in South Africa. So come and join me and I'll take you for a tour through the taxidermy. This is our showroom. This is the first you'll see when you arrive. We've got some trophies of our own here, clients' trophies and so forth. We are proud hunters ourselves, so we enjoy hunting and take pride in our work. And also, we understand the sentimental value of each trophy. It's not only a trophy, it is a memory, something which is made for life. So can, let me show you. All the trophies are delivered here. Sometimes we need to do some slaughtering. So we've got a cold room facility. And once your trophies arrive here from your outfitter, this is where we will tag them. Um, for us, it is really, really important that you get your own trophy back. And due to the sentimental value again, because it's a memory of a lifetime. So we do all our cape tanning in-house. We do a wet pullover process on the capes and so forth. I'll go through the processes quickly now. And this is where we do the fleshing. All the fleshing of the skins are done by hand, hand labor again. So each and every one of our personnel takes pride in what they're doing. So this is where we're busy fleshing some of the capes. Again, everything is done by hand. This is a way we make sure that every little bit stays together. That's your warthog in its own little bag. Again, with the labeling. This labeling comes out of our database, straight printed out, and all the label, every little bit of article are labeled. So every horn, every cape, everything is finally labeled. So you will find your outfitter stack on the specific horn or article. And then we've got our own internal tagging system. 
We do all the, all the packing and crating is done in house as well. We we purpose built each crate to specifications. So these trophies now are ready to be crated, and we built a crate, and this crate is going off to Germany. And this is the type of labels will be attached to your crate. And there you go, to give you an idea how we pack, everything is carefully packed and we don't oversize the crates, so you pay less on shipping. You can come and view trophies and get some ideas before you go out for the hunt. You're most welcome to stop by, come and say hi. I'm looking forward to meet you on your next hunt and please do come and visit. Come and stop by for a coffee or even a, a braai as we call it in South Africa that's actually a barbecue. Thank you for visiting. There's another video that you guys need to check out which is a full tour of his place. But I can promise you this, if you hunt here in Africa, he's the guy you want to use. Romano took us to Euphoria Golf Estate, one of his favorite courses here, where the vision and design of renowned and now retired Pro Golf Hall of Famer Annika Sornstrom, in collaboration with Stan Evey of European Golf Design come to life. Nestled within the breathtaking Waterberg Mountain Range in Limpopo, just two hours north of Johannesburg, this extraordinary award-winning golf course holds a unique distinction as the first course designed by a woman on the African continent. The Euphoria Golf Estate boasts a mixture of undulating terrain, a scattering of trees, narrow fairways, and even some open link style holes, resulting in a challenging round of golf. From the back tees, the course stretches over 7,700 yards, and Annika herself expressed that the course will favor the strategic player rather than the big hitter. The forward tees measure 5,659 yards, Yet, even the shorter tees demand control drive to score well in this magnificent layout. Notably due to the one mile elevation above sea level, golf balls will travel an additional 10% or more, which adds a new thrill to every shot. One hole that stands out as a contender for the signature hole is the short par 4 11th hole. The tee shot gracefully crosses over a winding stream and meanders along the left side of the fairway. The journey continues toward the only two-tiered green on the course, offering a thrilling challenge. Shortly after, you'll encounter the 13th hole, another magnificent par four. From the tee box, golfers have the opportunity to soak up panoramic vistas from the highest point on the course before launching their drives onto a fairway that dog legs to the left. Annika crafted this course to reward players who approach the game with strategy much like she did throughout her career. She said of Euphoria, you have to think about every shot course will favor the player that can think and play strategically. Beyond the exceptional golfing, Exforia Golf Estate remains committed to preserving and enhancing the indigenous flora and fauna of the region. Wide, undulating fairways are punctuated with zones of wild native grasses, deep bunkers, and a natural ravine that gracefully cuts across many of the holes. This integration of nature creates both aesthetic interest and an additional challenge for players with animals routinely crossing the fairways. Annika's unique approach to course design ensures that Euphoria Golf Estate caters to the entire family from young to old, as well as the highly skilled or average occasional weekend golfers. Thoughtful consideration was given to the placement of the forward tees, providing women, juniors, and seniors with an opportunity to indulge in the sheer natural beauty of the estate while enjoying a round of golf. This is a great bucket list golf course for any level of golfer and should not be missed.
Back at the lodge, the chef had prepared a braai for us, and that's one thing about Africa is that you won't go hungry. The food here is phenomenal, and chef took care of us the entire week. The staff and everybody was super friendly. It was a really, really great time here. You know, one of the most important things about any safari is making sure that you take care of those people that have taken care of you all week. So with that, we made sure and tip every single person that was part of the staff. They did a wonderful job for us and they really made there. the experience <laughs> one that we won't forget. You brought me luck. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for taking care of everything in there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Charles. Thank you. Thank you for everything. You're welcome. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thanks. Our last night in Africa around the campfire with Romano and Robert sharing stories about the week's hunt. Romano had one more surprise in store for us. Saturday night, we went out and we did a little night hunting on some jackals. That was cool to experience night hunting in South Africa. Hunting the jackals is very much like hunting coyotes in the US. You use a game call and a spotlight and it is a ton of fun. The next day after that, there's actually a hunting convention going on here called Hunt X, and it's a South African thing. You know, kind of like the DSC convention, only on a smaller scale, but it's, it's South African outfitters, and we got to go through and see the different exhibits see different products and experience more of the culture of South Africa. And then just like that, it's time to go home. So I had a wonderful time in Africa. Again, no video, no article, no words can really describe what it's like to come here. You have to come to Africa, period, end of story. But if you decide to come to Africa, make sure that you have a reputable outfitter, one that has high ethics, one that can be trustworthy, one that has references, and one like Romano from RDB Safaris. So when you come to hunt with RDB Safaris, I think the most important thing is that, yes, I'm the outfitter, but I will also be involved throughout the whole hunt. I mean, if you met me where or on email or at the show and you had a booking or want to book, I'm not just there to take your booking and be at the show to do the business. I'm actually right there and enjoying the time with you. Like, I, like my personality is to do that. Um, I feel like you need to be also a PH as far as you can for your own outfit and enjoy the hunt with your clients. When you come to hunt with RDB Safaris, you start off as a client on an email and when you leave here, really good friend or we become family. And that's what we say. Come here as a client, go away as a, as a family member. That's most probably why most of our clients or returning clients because we want to see them and they want to see us.